Everyone wants to know their purpose. All of us are interested in destiny. All of us want to know, why do I have these talents or abilities or what's going on here for me? And today, you are going to see what your purpose and destiny are. You say, oh, that's a very bold statement. It is. It's a very bold statement. And I can make this statement according to the Word of God and my own experience through the years with this very special teaching. What is your purpose? What is the power that's been placed in your life? What direction are you supposed to take? I'm telling you, you're going to love today. And it would be good if you just keep this in mind all through the program. I can know this because I can get on the website and download a test that will show me this also for myself. So this can be very personal for you. When you read Romans 12, you see that according to the grace of God, God has dealt a measure of faith to every one of us. So put your hand on your heart. Say, I have faith. God gave me faith. So it's not big, big, big faith, but it's a measure of faith. And then it begins to share what these seven areas of giftings God has given to the body of Christ. And it's to flow together to give really the picture of Jesus. So when you begin to see what your gift is, see, I told you this is a purpose program, you begin to see God's purpose in your life. So this is very, very key. And there are seven listed here in Romans 12. The first one that is listed is prophecy, which doesn't mean just to prophesy, but it means to discern and to know, to really make a difference between black and white. This person is very discerning of motives of people, motives of what's going on, direction of what God is doing at this time. And so we would say this is kind of the eye of the body. They have insight, insight into people, insight into situations and circumstances. But the second one is serving. And this is the hand of the body. And this person, and perhaps this is you, this per person loves to serve. They want to wait on people. They want to help people. They're very available. They want to see the things get done and that ev there are no crises. And if there is a crisis, they want to help in the crises, the hand of the body. But then the third one is the teacher. And I call this the uh, ear of the body because this person hears the word. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. And they want to get everybody in the Bible. And always, always they'll say, now was that sermon really scriptural? Is there really the word involved in this? Are you reading your Bible? And they're on you, on you, on you. Oh, it has to be Bible, has to be Bible. And then the fourth one is the exhorter, probably the most popular. Maybe that's you. They love to counsel people. They love people. They want to be sure all the preaching and teaching is applicable to people. They're people, people. And what are they? And I put them as kind of a tree because they like to develop people to grow into what they should be. These are often counselors, exhorters, love to counsel. So then we see the four, but then there's another one we want to look at today, and this is the giving motive. And these are all listed in Romans 12. And this is the person who is very entrepreneurial, likes to make money, and likes to give money, and wants to be sure the financial needs of the body of Christ are met. They don't have to be motivated to give. They already got it on the inside. And so they're very powerful and very needed. And perhaps you're that kind of a person. It just seems like you know how to make money and you know how to give money. Oh, we can put a dollar sign by you because you are motivated to meet the financial needs of the body. Very important. And your example helps others to give. But then the sixth one is the organizational motive. And this person loves to set goals, loves to be a part of a goal and motivate people and develop people to reach the goal. So I always just write just kind of a profile because this person is so directed for goals and likes to organize people, very organized, and get people involved. And when the goal is over, they like to have a new goal. Is that you? Hey, is that you? And the last one... I draw as a heart of the body, and this is mercy. And this person wants to be sure everything that is done is merciful. Oh, they don't want cruel words said. 
They don't want the exhorter to counsel in a cruel way. They don't want the teacher to be cruel. They want to be merciful in the teaching. They want the giver, be merciful with people now. They want the organizer, don't just hurt and crush people. Everything has to be mercy. They are the heart of the body. Now, I opened the program and I said, you need to get on our website and download the test to see who you are. But I thought on the program, again, we just kind of show and see how you react. And, you know, maybe we get a little preview of you and who you are in the body of Christ. Are you ready? Are you ready? Now, I have this glass of water and I have permission to spill this in our studio. But if I spilled this water and you had a prophecy motive, you would say, Marilyn, you need to repent of that. Be more careful about water on a platform like that. Repent, <laughs> you know. So you're always looking, get people to repent, you know, black, white, so on. But a serving, oh, if you had a serving motive, you wouldn't say repent at all. You say, I'll clean it up, not to worry, I'll pour some more water in. Is that you? Are you the hand? Or <laughs> if you are the teaching motive, you would say, oh my, what is this in the Bible? Can you find this in the Bible? Is what you're doing really scriptural? And so you want everything to be geared on the Bible. And then the exhorter, they would say, oh, let's see, what spiritual lesson could you learn? Oh, you spilled that water. Maybe there's a spiritual lesson in this. They always want you to get a spiritual lesson out of everything you do. But then the giver would say, not to worry, I'll buy some water for the next program. You'll have bottles, don't worry, you know, I got it covered. And the organizer would say, now this is what we need to do. When they tape the next program, we need to get some volunteers who will bring bottled water and extra glasses in case we need it and be sure this thing is covered when they do the program. You know, they want it to go well, they want people to be organized for it, they want to meet the goal. But I think the most interesting one is the reaction of the mercy motive. Maybe because my husband, no question, has a mercy motive. If I spilled this water and you had a mercy motive, you would say, oh, Marilyn, I don't want you to be embarrassed. The last speaker we had spilled water too. And so you're always concerned about the person's feelings. One of those are yours. Maybe two. Or maybe you have developed yourself into three or four. And no question, God uses us in all of them. He uses us in all of them. And that's good. But there's one we're the most comfortable in and one we're the most successful in. Now, let me share why I'm so turned on to this and so turned on for you. To know your purpose, know your direction. My husband and I started a church many years ago here in Denver. And the expectations for me as a pastor's wife, uh, were just out of sync for me because I couldn't play the piano, I couldn't play the organ. And most pastor's wives were musical. I was not. And then a lot of pastor's wives led worship. They could sing. I couldn't sing. And then in churches also, the pastor's wife would have kind of the mission part for women and you would roll bandages and uh, you would make things for people who had leprosy and you would sew blankets for children and babies and it was a big sewing thing and folks I couldn't sew well and plus it was just flat boring to me what did I like to do I like to teach I like to teach the Bible so I taught Sunday school I had an adult class I just loved it and I taught home Bible studies, places where people were not Christians and over a cup of coffee and a cookie and the Bible, they would get saved. And I loved doing this, but I felt out of sync because I wasn't like other pastor's wives. But listen to me, when I got this teaching, man, I said, oh, I see who I am in the body. I'm a teacher. There's nothing wrong with my wanting to teach the Bible. And it really gave me confidence in what God had for me and the grace He had given me. And it also released a faith in me to teach the Bible that I wasn't out of sync. I wasn't some crazy pastor's wife who was going to hurt their husband. I was going to be a blessing to the church. I was going to be a blessing to my husband. And so I encourage you to again today, get on the website, get the test, and check yourself out and even others. Now, if you also would say, 
oh, I need prayer for some special things here, I would also say get on the website for prayer because we take those needs and we pray over them. Now today you say, but how can I grow in those gifts and develop them? Because there are weaknesses and there are strengths. And so I'm going to be sharing just here in a little bit about the strengths and the weaknesses. And I'm going to give you some Bible examples that will help you know who's who and what's what in the Bible. Now this will help you with your children. Trust me, because when I got hold of Romans 12, I began to see what Sarah's gift was. I began to see what my son's gift was. I saw my husband's gift. And I didn't try to make them me because I wanted everybody to teach the Bible. Well, if everybody taught the Bible, who would listen to it? And so I began to see. I don't have to make everybody me, and I don't have to compete with the rest of the body. I need the body. We flow together as one. And I don't have to compare them. Oh, they don't read the Bible as much as I do. Or they're always out there serving and cooking food. They're not spiritual. So I got out of that kind of, what can I say, critical, judgmental realm by the knowledge of this. And then knowing your children's gifts. Now I'm watching my grandchildren and I'm seeing their gifts. I think Sarah's youngest and he's uh, seven. I wouldn't be at all surprised if he doesn't have a mercy motive because he so doesn't want anybody to be hurt. Ugh. And I look at Isabel, she's the oldest, she's 10, and watching her giftings, and I haven't totally put her in a box yet, but I see several strong giftings like organizing, setting goals, and she's very, she loves to organize something. And she loves to get people involved in meeting that goal. And so I'm thinking, could this be what God has put in her, the special grace in her? So it will help you, yes, to identify yourself, but yes, to identify family, yes, to identify other members in the body of Christ. Stay right there. I'm going to be right back. Have you ever wondered how you fit in the body of Christ and what your place is? And why do other Christians act the way they act? I have a wonderful book, you must have it. Know Your Ministry. It will show you where you fit and everyone else. Sarah has also helped me with this. It'll be powerful. And we have the three CD set that accompanies it. You will love finding your place. Everyone has gifts and talents, but do you know what gift is the foundation of your God-given purpose in life? For your gift of $25 or more, we'll send you Marilyn and Sarah's new three-CD set, Know Your Ministry. These teachings will help you discover your core gift through which you will obtain the most success. For your gift of $50 or more, we'll also send you the companion book, Know Your Ministry, Spiritual Gifts for Every Believer. This book will help you discover and enjoy your unique life calling and exercise your full potential. Discover your special gift today. Call or click to receive this offer. Nobody wants to just stumble bumble around and why do I feel this way and what are my talents and abilities and what direction am I supposed to take and is there a destiny for me? Yes. And there is a purpose and God shows us beautifully in this Romans 12. These seven gifts, one of them is yours and perhaps two or three you're being used in and, and because you have Jesus inside you and he's all of them, you can be used in all of them, but usually one or two are where you're the most comfortable and the most successful. So I want to look at prophecy and give you a Bible example. Who in the Bible had a prophecy motive? You say, well, the prophets. 
Not all the prophets had prophecy motives. So let me give you a little example. Like the prophet Hosea. There's a whole book on Old Testament called Hosea. I love this little book. Oh, it is so sweet. And you know, it's the prophet whose wife was so immoral and he took her back and their marriage was restored. He is merciful. So although Hosea is a prophet, his motive is mercy. So not all of them, because they're, because they're called a prophet, have a motive gift that real power of destiny and purpose is to just be a prophecy motive. So let's take an example. I'm going to take an example in the New Testament. John the Baptist. He loved to call people to repentance. Wow. And prophecy motive people are very direct. I mean, they don't play around. I mean, they just call a shot like it is. And so he loved to do it. I mean, he called them generation of vipers. I mean, if somebody called you a snake, that's pretty direct. And so he, he was very much into discerning people's motives. He was very much into seeing where they needed to repent and directing them to repent. And a lot of people repented, you know, in that ministry. But also I've noticed in people with prophecy motives, now listen to this, they like visuals. They like some kind of a visual aid that also tells what their purpose is. So if I look at John the Baptist, you say, well, what do you mean? It's the way he dressed. You know, he didn't dress in a suit and coat and tie. You know, he really dressed in uh, camel's hair and it drew attention to him. And it was kind of rude, crude, uncouth because his message was rude, crude, and uncouth. So you will find often people with prophecy motives, they have something they do to make their message more direct and more real. And that goes with that. Now, let's look a little bit of weaknesses. You know, you can be so black as black and white as white that you're unkind. And the Bible says we're to speak the truth in love. When Sarah was growing up, of course, I'm looking, what, what's her, her motive gift? You know, what's her gift here that's operating in her life? And I saw prophecy very much. She wanted the truth. She was very black, very white. You know, really, people need to repent. And so I said to her, Sarah, you can turn people off if you don't know how to speak the truth in love. And there's a wisdom that goes with this gift you know, that you need to operate in. So we see strengths and we see weaknesses. And of course, you can go through your Bible now as you read through your Bible and think, yeah, that one had a prophecy motive. That one had a serving motive. And since we're at serving the hand of the body, I want to talk about Ruth. I want to talk about Martha. Ruth had a serving motive. She served a mother-in-law, very much so went out in the fields and got grain and worked very, very hard to get food for herself and her mother-in-law and always serving. And even after she married Boaz and had a baby, if you remember, the baby was put in Naomi's hands. And so serving has great blessing with it. Don't ever put it down. When people say, well, you know, I'm not called to serve. Everybody's to serve. Jesus is a servant. He washed their feet. He held their babies. He said, when we go to heaven, he will gird himself and wait on us. You know, he's ever lives to intercede for us. He always serves. If you're too big to serve, I'm sorry, you're bigger than Jesus. Ah! You say, that sounds like a little prophecy motive here, <laughs> right? And so serving is so important. And none of us, no matter what your gifting is here, oh, I don't serve. I, I you know, I'm an exhorter. Give me a break. All of us give a hand when we need to. And so we see that Ruth was really, really blessed. She got the key man, the wealthy man, the most spiritual man, and got to be the part of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. But if she had said, I'm not serving that mother-in-law, she whines all the time, uh, let her go out and get her own grain, get her own food. I don't believe you would see her name in Matthew 1. Serving, very key. Okay, let's talk about Martha. Because sometimes people, I think they identify some negative things with Martha. Because Mary sat at Jesus' feet and Martha was fixing dinner. And Martha got upset and said, Mary needs to come help me. And so we just 
dump everything on Martha. Now, it said Mary also sat at the feet of Jesus, if you read this in Luke. So Mary didn't just sit at Jesus' feet. She helped too. But Martha, she's the hand. And man, everything, she's got to serve everything. And she probably had extra company because Jesus is there. Everybody wanted to come and hear Jesus, wanted him to heal them. So she has a big load. Okay, now let's look at how she was blessed. <clears throat> when her brother died, who did Jesus come to first? Martha. Who did he say would see the glory of God? Martha. Who was at the tomb when he called Lazarus out? Martha. So servers, yeah, they can get out of sync and get too much. It's all serving, serving, serving and nothing spiritual because they like to be the hand. They want to see needs met so much. But folks, we can be both. We can be spiritual and serve. Just keep Jesus the center of your serving and not yourself and what your hand finds to do. So that's key to us. Another thing I have found about servers, they don't usually organize well. They can, you know, serve real well. And I see this in <laughs> church kitchens. They'll serve and serve and serve. But if you put them in charge of the kitchen, uh, they mess it up. So you need somebody who's who has organizational ability and direction. And they say, you do the gravy, you do the salads, you serve the table, you know, you do the cleanup. And so this is where, again, I like this. We see how these gifts flow together. I need you. You need me. I need the body. And you say, I'm sure, I'm still not sure where I am. I'm not sure where my children are, my grandchildren. Hey, get on our website and you can download that test. And of course, you can leave your prayer request because we want to pray over them. And maybe you're saying today, I don't know my purpose. I just don't get it. Hey, leave your name and say purpose beside it and let us pray for you. Of course, you can always write us with prayer requests. But I just think this is a very powerful, important time. So we've looked at prophecy. We saw John the Baptist. We looked at serving. We've seen Naomi and Ruth. And we've also seen Martha. But what about teaching? What is the teacher? The teacher likes information, you know, in, in numerical order. They want everything numerical. They want to be sure people are in the Bible. Uh, do you read the Bible? Did that person when they preach, did they give scripture? Is the Bible really behind this? Are you basing your life on the Bible? Do you speak the word of God? Do you have a plan to read through the Bible? That's a teacher. And who in the Bible would I pick out for a teacher? Well, my personal opinion is Paul. Paul to me really is a teacher because he wrote 13 epistles, and I've memorized most of them. Right now, I'm just finishing first, memorizing 1 Corinthians, so I'm in chapter 15, the resurrection chapter. He gives truth in a very orderly manner. Like, you know, 1 Corinthians 13, it's all love. It tells you what love is not, tells you what love is, and tells you how to take hold of love. Hmm. So he gives you a very orderly way. When I am memorizing 1 Corinthians 14, I mean, he really tells you what prophecy is, who it helps, and what goes on. But he also tells you about speaking in tongues, what it is, when to do it, when not to do it, and how they flow together. Orderliness in it. He is a teacher of teachers. And so when we begin to see who we are and see who others are, we don't compete. We're just delighted to have them. They help us. Because you see, seven is the number of completion. And these seven gifts, oh, they give the complete picture of Jesus Christ. I'm so excited for you. I know God has purpose and destiny working in your life and in your family. We are so excited because we get to visit Greece and Rome this fall and we want you to come with us. When we're in Greece, we get to see Mars Hill, lots and lots of other very cool historical places. And in Rome, we get to go to the Colosseum, we get to go to the Sistine Chapel. Mom, amazing things. This is gonna be a very powerful trip. And while we are there, we are going to get to see the Pope because he comes out and gives a special address. I've never gotten to do that. I've been to Rome, I don't know how many times, how special that is going to be. And when you do Bible teaching in Rome and Greece, I mean, the Bible's full of it. The book of Acts is full of it. And you will see things I've never seen. 
in both places, right. both Rome and Greece. We have an agenda that is just shocking and wonderful. Now, what do you need to do? You need to get on the phone, get on our website, get the brochure, put it in your Bible, start praying over it, and invite others to go with you. This would be a trip of a lifetime. Have you ever wondered how you fit in the body of Christ and what your place is? And why do other Christians act the way they act? I have a wonderful book, you must have it. Know Your Ministry. It will show you where you fit and everyone else. Sarah has also helped me with this. It'll be powerful. And we have the three CD set that accompanies it. You will love finding your place. Everyone has gifts and talents, but do you know what gift is the foundation of your God-given purpose in life? For your gift of $25 or more, we'll send you Marilyn and Sarah's new three-CD set, Know Your Ministry. These teachings will help you discover your core gift through which you will obtain the most success. For your gift of $50 or more, we'll also send you the companion book, Know Your Ministry, Spiritual Gifts for Every Believer. This book will help you discover and enjoy your unique life calling and exercise Exercise your full potential. Discover your special gift today. Call or click to receive this offer. I'm very happy. I want to encourage you and share with you, specifically if you're struggling with being uh, unemployed. You know, in America, around the world, many people are struggling with this issue of unemployment. And as I was praying about this, I felt like God led me to 1 Samuel chapter 9. In 1 Samuel chapter 9, Saul had been assigned by his dad to go and find some donkeys. And Saul looked, he was diligent, he took a servant with him, looked for like three days and went to all different kinds of places, couldn't find the donkeys, couldn't find the donkeys, couldn't find the donkeys. And some of you watching right now, that's how you feel. You say, I've been looking, I've been looking, I've been knocking on doors, I've been sending resumes, I've been filling out applications, I'm looking and I'm just not landing this job. I'm not getting any open doors. I'm not finding the job that I need. And God wants to encourage you today that He has the right provision at the right time. And sometimes the, the path that He takes us on requires us to trust Him, that we can, He can be our provider and that we can trust that He will lead and guide and direct our steps. Because at the end of this search for these donkeys, Saul never found the donkeys, but he ran into Samuel and Samuel anointed him to be the king. You ought to read this in 1 Samuel chapter 9. It's just really powerful. When Samuel anointed Saul to be the king, Samuel spoke to him and said, The donkeys have been found. Don't sweat them. That's over. But I have an assignment for you from God. And when the season is over for this unemployment, God has an assignment for you, has a destiny, has a purpose, has an anointing for you in your new position, in your new job, in your new situation. And God wants to encourage you that He is organizing your steps. He's leading you. He's guiding you moment by moment, day by day, people by people. God is leading and guiding you to the provision He has for your job and for His kingdom.